Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, another episode of The Professor and the CEO. Uh, I'm Ben Gillen, CEO at Third Way Group. And um, just a quick reminder why Rachel and I are doing this series is uh, over the course of my career, certainly throughout the crisis, I've really benefited from talking to Rachel and other people who have studied business and give me really great insights into behavioral patterns and past experiences that businesses have gone through. And we thought it'd be a great series to do to sort of talk about the crisis and talk about the firsthand experience that uh, we at Third Way are going through. And, uh, and hope that that reaches other business owners and people who are interested in business and indeed studying in the crisis uh, to learn from that. So today we're talking about uh, empathy and the role of empathy within leadership in an organization. Um, Rachel, is there anything you wanted to, to add on top of that? Just to maybe introduce myself and to say that I'm Rachel Dorn and I'm a senior lecturer in entrepreneurship and my research tends to focus on entrepreneurship in times of crisis with a particular focus on crisis management and resilience. And as Ben mentioned today, and those of you who are joining us, welcome. We're discussing the role of empathy in a crisis. And if you have any questions throughout the session, please include them in the uh, chat function. We'll be sure to, to get to those in a little while. So I just wanted to begin by saying a few words about empathy and why it's important in the workplace. So empathy really reflects the desire and the ability to understand the feelings of another person. And protect, perspective taking is often associated with empathy. So that's the ability to see the merit or the value in someone else's point of view, to really understand their position or understand what it's like to be in their shoes. And I think empathy is important in the workplace for a number of reasons. Uh, firstly, there is some research to suggest that empathy is positively related to job performance. So empathic business leaders, their, their performance is rated more highly by their employees. So they're seen as doing their jobs better than those individuals who are rated lower on empathy. Uh, research also suggests that leadership approaches that espouse benevolence, which is all about protection and caring for others and empathy, that they tend to create the kinds of organizational cultures that are characterized by appreciation, allegiance, trust, and also lead to higher levels of job satisfaction, employee satisfaction rather, within the organization. And I think empathy is also important in the workplace because it creates the kind of organizations that people want to work in uh, or with and for. So for instance, it can increase retention rates, employee retention rates within organizations, but also it can positively influence the organization's brand to customers and to clients. So your employees are your ambassadors of your products and services. And I think clients and customers really pick up on when they're treated well within the organization. And empathy further within an organization can fuel collaboration and innovation. So certainly that's not an exhaustive list by any means, but just some of the, um, some of the reasons why empathy can be important in business or in the workplace. And, and Ben, I wanted to turn to you by asking say anyone who thinks it doesn't have a, has a role to play um, is wrong and I think they're uh, perhaps lacking in empathy <laughs> you know imagine working for an organization where your your feelings and your opinions and uh, the experiences you were going through didn't matter it doesn't sound like a very attractive place to go and work so I think empathy is is vitally important I think where uh, people perhaps feel uh, it's not important is in decision making and I think what happens is that often decision making can be clouded by empathy uh, what people need to recognize is empathy has a place and you can compartmentalize it in the decision-making process to either use it at the beginning to sort of have an understanding of the impact it's going to have on people, plan, and then at the end, how you message it to people. So yeah, empathy is, is vitally, vitally important. It was interesting as you, as you were speaking about empathy there, it made me go back to our core value session. And actually, um, one of the things I'm actually proud of as I was thinking about our core values is that there's empathy in the core values. You know, the, the, the empathy for us is it's about the people. It's always the people. Um, and that's sort of that, that core principle for us. And but that is incredibly empathetic. And, uh, and it's definitely something that, that we strive to do um, in third way. Uh, can you give me or do you have any other examples of how empathy maybe has played out at mm. third way? Mm -hmm. I think um, it's particularly interesting now, isn't it? Uh, because we're, we're in a we're in a crisis and in a crisis. Um, you have your, your management team, your board, who perhaps know everything that's going on, can see all the dials, all the different scenarios, and for good reason, 
aren't necessarily disclosing all of those because they could either uh, they could inspire fear, shall we say, if if you mm. if you saw all the possible downsides in the crisis. But then what? The management team, and to us at times, we've not been the best at this in this crisis. I've been slow to do is recognize, like, at least we know. Knowing creates a level of certainty, creates a level of comfort. And what we've really realized is, and it's something we're really actioning throughout the rest of the year, is giving people certainties. Like, even if it's in bite-sized chunks, pieces of certainty, because you know, I'm empathizing with them, realize if they've got that certainty, they're not worrying about their bills. They're not worrying about their rent. They're not worrying about, can we look after the family? What's going to happen at Christmas? What's going to happen to my job? So um, that's a really important sort of, you know, demonstration or application of empathy sort of in, in the crisis. Thank you. And I wanted to speak a little bit about some of the, uh, some of the benefits and challenges of being empathic or showing empathic leadership in a crisis. And there is some research to suggest that empathy is a valuable characteristic that business leaders have that might enable them to manage a crisis well, whereas a lack of empathy might, um, might lead to, a, to failure to manage the crisis in a, in a positive way. And so I wanna mention a few different benefits. So one of the benefits is that empathy can provide business leaders with access to important information. So thinking back to a few episodes ago where we discussed preparing for a crisis and detecting vulnerabilities, some of the things we discussed was a, we're around the importance of having an anticipation mindset within the organization to anticipate potential problems, but also to create a no blame culture where people are okay about sharing their concerns and the potential problems that they might anticipate and coming together periodically to think about how those problems might be resolved and who might be responsible for such. And I think when business leaders are empathic, they create that kind of culture where people feel comfortable to share their concerns. So not necessarily even relation in relation to the current pandemic, but in relation to crises generally, trying to anticipate what can go wrong within the organization. I think emotional cues can also clue business leaders into uh, potential problems that might arise, but also how long they might last. And in the case of the current crisis, I think empathy can also clue business leaders into some of the challenges that they might face in relation to business recovery, especially as it relates to all the complexity around individual circumstances. So in terms of individuals' health concerns, in terms of individuals' comfort levels, in relation to going into work, in, in relation to individuals' living situations or caring responsibilities, all of these things. And an empathic business leader can sit down and, and work with these individuals or collectively as an organization to think about what can we do in a positive manner to work to, to move forward. And some of the business owners I've been speaking to over the last few weeks and months have said that um, you know, after the first lockdown, for instance, in the UK, not everybody was ready to go back to work or felt comfortable in doing so. I see Ben nodding uh, at the same time. And so, you know, having to, you know, come up with alternative arrangements for these individuals, which in some settings might be quite difficult. So if you have a remote capacity to what you do, then, then that might be more straightforward in terms of setting up people at home with IT support and otherwise. If you're in a face-to-face -face line of work like hospitality, the solutions might be um, still there, but less numerous in, in numbers. So it's about working with your staff. So empathy can provide business leaders with important information in relation to a crisis, but empathy can also give business leaders and employees a greater sense and deeper sense of appreciation for one another, I think as well. So a lot of people I've been speaking to over the last little while, again, business owners, managers, and CEOs have suggested that the crisis in a way has brought them closer together, where they have a better understanding for individuals' uh, circumstances at home. And um, also that their teams in many ways have stepped up and stepped in to alleviate some of the pressures on those individuals, which has been quite, um, quite helpful. Employees in turn might reflect on the crisis and how their business leaders have been managing such and how their organizations have been managing such. And if they've been clear in their communications and if they've had to make difficult decisions, but have done so in a, in a positive way in terms of how they've communicated, if they've uh, sort of decentralized some of those processes and tried to create less rather than more bureaucracy, then I think people will reflect positively in a way on this period, which might help recovery, but also the post-crisis period as well. Um, and then finally, I think empathy can also allow business leaders to be more reflexive or reflective of their 
own leadership style and roles over the last uh, few weeks and months to see, hey, you know, where have I been performing well and how have I been responding and to, you know, take some pride in all of their efforts in relation to such, but also to think about how can I do things differently? How can I change? How can I adapt? How can I improve? So Ben, what would you say? say and as you're speaking there um i was in a very reflective mode and you know I would, I would say actually um i've done this quite badly but i mean what crisis can do is is as a leader push you a little bit into bunker mentality um in that you know you're planning and you're and you're defending and on, a, on multiple levels and um perhaps even you you hide from human interaction because you don't want to betray your thoughts or, you know, you don't want to dampen the mood by, uh, or, or be a different mood. You're sort of like really, really spiraling into a, into a defensive position. And um, that has an impact on, on empathy because naturally you're, you're becoming self-absorbed. And I think if I, if I look back to uh, you know, one of my favorite sayings about businesses are um, businesses are just the mobilization of human endeavor. Like whatever business it is, fundamentally, it's human beings somewhere being mobilized um, to to achieve something great. Um, and perhaps, perhaps I've been guilty of forgetting that. And it's been focusing on the, the company and not the people enough during this time. I think what, um, you know, as you're talking then, I'm starting to reflect on myself, what it's enabling me to do is think, hang on, there's, there's 160 other people uh, who are going through a crisis at the moment. It's not just me. Um, and their crisis is going to be very real to them, uh, whether it's health, whether it's their own economic situation, whether it's the strain on mental health that I'm sure 80 or 90% of us are going through at the moment. Um, mm. And you know, it's going back to, well, how do I mobilize these individuals to, to be in this joint endeavor with me? And um, to be honest, I, I think uh, I, I really want you to ask me that question in a month's time. And I really want to be able to, to tell you the things, the things that I've done to, uh, to improve empathy uh, within, within the organization. Well, I mean, sort of digging a bit further and giving yourself a break a little bit. What what do you think you've done well? Uh, or um, what do you think your management team have done well? Or what have you observed in other client-based mm. organizations that they've done well? I think I think there's there's three things I would say in this crisis that I think I think we we did well. One was um, the upfront communication and um, support in terms of people working from home, i.e., IT equipment software licenses, the, the sense that we will uh, move to working from home and we will support you in that piece. The second piece is as we've transitioned through, like we're as a business, collaboration is key. And I think uh, a lot of people have found that uh, Zoom and Skype and uh, other video conferencing providers is fantastic for a period of time. And then actually when it comes down to creativity and real problem solving, actually nothing beats sort of perhaps being together and chance interactions. So the second piece is very much making the office a safe environment for people to return to. So that making sure that the uh, the way we've spaced things, the way we've put signage up, the way we've put hygiene products in place is that people know that when they come to the environment, it's mm -hmm. protected. Um, and, the, and the comms throughout. And I think sort of in, in these last, and actually we've um, we've increased that. We, you know, we, we want people back in our workplace. Um, we are a better business. We're more productive. Um, we, we're achieving better outcomes when we're together, but it's giving people sort of the confidence to talk and the confidence um, that when they come in, it's, it's going to be particularly safe. And I'd say the last thing is, um, particularly at the sort of the front end of the business, we spent quite a bit of time really trying to like clarify what people's targets were and make them really simple to understand and real simple explanations as to why that was their target. So for certain sort of, um, like uh, people where we just sort of tweaked what they did. It was bringing them into a confidence as to why we're asking them to do that. Be real, real clarity as to what they're doing and then see if they've got any questions or for them to ask those questions. So I'd say they were the three, the three things in the crisis that I could, uh, could say, yeah, we did okay on those, I suppose. Great, thank you. And there are of course some challenges associated with um, being empathic in a crisis or let's say too empathic. So some researchers have suggested that too much empathy could um, be a disadvantage in a crisis because 
it might make it difficult for business leaders to make important decisions um, as a result. So because there is this need or this desire to put individual needs first above the organizational ones. Um, but also because it can increase uh, high levels of empathy can actually increase one's own suffering mm -hmm. through a process of emotional contagion. And it can finally also squeeze already limited resources of those individuals. So let's go through each of them in turn. So in the first case, empathy can lead to decision-making bias or paralysis. So if you are the kind of individual that's really in tune with the, with the feelings, with the emotions of others, you might be concerned every time you need to make a decision because you're always thinking about how will it affect this person or that person. And you might at times put the needs of those individuals, again, above the organizational ones. So Ben, do you think that business leaders who show a lot of empathy, you sort of alluded to it earlier, might have difficulty making tough decisions in a, yeah. in a crisis because, because they do so, because they put, they put those needs above the, they put individual needs above the lead, the needs of the organizational Definitely. ones. Do you think Definitely. that's, is that a, is that yeah, a thing, is that a problem? It, it, it's a huge problem. It's a huge yeah. problem. Um, and um, I would say it's not just, just leaders. I see it in management teams, anyone who's running yeah. a team. Um, what I've often found is that you know, I have a lot of friends uh, who own businesses or think about running a business and they come to me with a problem. And objectively, I can give them the answer immediately. So like, this is what you need to do in this situation. And then sometimes I reflect, so actually, I've got the same problem and I'm mm. not taking my own advice. And the reason is, is that sometimes it's so hard to separate the individual from the role and the impact of changing a role, and the impact that that has on the individual. A great piece of advice someone gave me was um, be cerebral in your planning and empathetic in your execution. And I think that's the right way to be, that you have to as a leader, get yourself in the mindset that my task is to get the best possible outcome for the organization and the individual. And I need to start with the organization and then I need to move on to the individual and then align those two things together. And one of the things I, I say in third way to all the staff, you know, if we have staff who wanna come and do a particular training or a particular piece of development that requires investment, my answer is always, if it's good for the business and good for you, the answer will always be yes. If it's good for the business and bad for you, my answer should be no. And if it's good for you, but bad for the business, my answer is definitely no. And like that's how sort of try and rationalize, uh, rationalize that empathy and that decision-making. And I think, sorry, I'm going on a bit, Rachel. I think empathy, the, I always feel like a good business leader is uh, someone who's a B plus at almost everything and an A at a couple of things. And empathy for me is like one of the, the firm sort of B plus boxes that you need as a leader. It's a tool that you need to understand, you need to understand the power of it, but you also need to understand that that power can be crippling as well. That if it's stopping you from making key decisions, particularly in a crisis, because you're trying to perhaps protect one individual, you might harm a hundred individuals. So you have, to, you have to know how to deploy it and you also have to be brave with yourself about when to park it and how to use it. Yes, so yeah, so one of the challenges is that empathy can lead to decision-making bias or paralysis as Ben has nicely illustrated as well. But empathy can also lead to emotional contagion. So emotional contagion is the tendency to take on the emotions of other people. And it usually in involves some kind of process of transference via mimicry, so mimicking the emotions of others. So in this way, emotions can infect and emotions can be caught. And it's, as a result in helping, let's say over the last few weeks and months, your team, members of your team to absorb some of the shocks of the crisis, as people are concerned about redundancies, as people are concerned about their own health and catching and spreading the virus, that their emotions, their negative emotions, their anxieties, their fears, their anger, their frustrations, et cetera, can be picked up by, by you, by people in positions of responsibility, managers, CEOs, business owners. And um, it can lead to challenges, of course, for those individuals in terms of their own well-being and levels of um, energy levels as well. So business leaders can actually protect themselves from emotional contagion by practicing what's known as emotion regulation. So emotion regulation is about um, the fact that we can influence the emotions we experience, when we experience them, and how we express them as well. And during the pandemic, some 
entrepreneurs have been telling me that they have been doing these things in part by reflecting more or when and where possible on positive emotions. So thinking about or feeling optimistic about the future, but also feeling proud about how they and their team have responded and how they're working together to plan ahead. Uh, but also people might regulate their emotions by spending less time or limiting their time on certain activities and practicing more self-care as a result. So emotional contagion is something to, to look out for for certain uh, and is something that's very empathic business leaders might be prone to. And empathy might also leave business leaders with fewer resources. So some researchers have argued that very empathic business leaders, because they're always attending to the feelings of other people and trying to uh, respond to such, that they might have less uh, time and less cognitive resources or headspace to deal with other issues that are pressing during the crisis has been alluded to, like structural issues or strategic issues or even technical issues around the crisis. And I think this is especially um, worrisome or an issue for small business owners who already have a number of demands on them and for whom the crisis has created even more demands and they're wearing many hats in any case. So for instance, one of the individuals I spoke to a couple of months ago mentioned that in having all these different kinds of meetings to, to build collegiality within the organization and to connect people, that it was creating so much extra work uh, to have these meetings, social and professional ones, much more so than they would normally have experienced uh, when they're doing face-to-face -face meetings uh, in pre-crisis times. So Ben, do you think... Um, the answer is it's it's they must you know like that is they are all the considerations that that you have to take into account when when trying to make a decision the emotional contagion is a great term i've never come across it before before today in this this topic and it's um it's one of those um scenarios isn't it where something that on the face of it is positive like empathy is almost a virtue can become a real negative um, and can become, yeah, contagion is a great word. It's like, it's, it's consuming. And um, yeah, it is, it is a problem. I think as a business leader, the best advice I can give or how, how, I, how I try and do it myself is, is when, whenever something um, emotional happens, something of an individual happens, it is overwhelming. Like you can, um, you can sort of feel really strongly about uh, what you should do. And I've often find actually taking myself for a walk, you know, the old adage of like, you know, sleep on it see if you feel the same way tomorrow is is true like you have to take yourself out of it um almost hover above yourself looking down at it and um make an, an objective decision um and i think with a, with a leader you have an advantage that you're never really making a decision just about an individual you're making a decision about an individual about the company about the strategy of the company about the culture of the company and about the way you're going to treat every other individual within your organization. So I actually find that quite comforting because it enables me not to just stay in one moment or with one thought process, but to, to really have a considered um, approach to how I deal with perhaps a, a problem with, a, with an individual or um, a, a, a scenario where I have to show empathy. And you know, with the, it's a great question you ask because you've got like stakeholders, staff, clients, um, suppliers subcontractors there's so many different people with different and possibly even like competing demands for empathy right. and you know, it's a real um it's, it's it's a real skill to sort of be aware of that and you don't necessarily want to rank them you want to create a, an environment where the ecosystem and the culture you're creating is alive to all of them and is i think transparent and clear with them as to how you can meet their needs, but how sometimes you can't because it's in conflict with someone else within that whole stakeholder group. So um, sorry if that's sort of a bit abstract, but, but yeah. for me, that's, um, you know, that's how I think a business owner needs to, and any leader, any manager needs to approach, approach uh, empathy in that situation. Thank you. And I think one of the final areas I wanted to cover was to discuss how we as individuals generally, as employees, as business managers, CEOs, 
business owners and so on, and how organizations in general, how can we all be more empathic? Because there are some benefits, uh, certainly. And going back to what you said at the beginning as well, I think empathy is important in general in the workplace and certainly in times of crisis. So I think there is a lot of research on this and there are a lot of uh, news articles and so social media publications as well. And just trying to collate some of those different ideas. I think one of the, the first um, issues or topics that comes up is, is really practicing active listening. So that's something that we can do to be more empathic. And that's all about thinking and reflecting on the verbal and nonverbal cues that we give to people when they are sharing something with us. So our tone of voice, our facial expressions, our body language, um, but also listening without judgment. I think that's important. Another thing we can do is we can practice perspective taking. So again, trying to think about what it's like to be in someone else's position, what it's like to be in their shoes right now at this time during the crisis or otherwise. But also I think um, if you're creating this kind of culture where you're encouraging people to share their concerns and to be open, I think it's also about making people feel comfortable and feeling safe in their capacity to do so. So that's why telling people that you value what they're saying, telling people that you understand and you think it's okay, for instance, in the current pandemic to feel a bit fearful or to feel a bit frustrated. And more importantly, not to feel uncomfortable when people are sharing those kinds of experiences with us. Another thing we can do is that we can reflect together on the kinds of positive solutions that you can create together as a, as a, again, as a team and showing people that you care by affording them some flexibility in their work. And I know a lot of people, a lot of organizations have been doing that in terms of creating different work arrangements given the, the circumstances. But I think another thing that's really important for business leaders in particular, so people who have positions of power and responsibility with, within organizations is also to connect more with people in your organization by sharing your own experiences. Um, so how things are going really for you. And I think um, sometimes business leaders feel that, uh, you know, and that there's, you know, something behind this. Um, it can be real or self-imposed. They need to always be okay. They always need to project to everybody else that everything is fine and you're managing in particular quite well. But I think in a crisis like the current pandemic, that's not necessarily the best approach. You know, pretending everything is fine when for a lot of organizations, it's clearly not, uh, might be perceived by your staff to be not very authentic in the former case, but also positive emotions aren't always positive in the sense that they can breed complacency. So people might think, well, everything is fine. Whereas negative emotions, occasionally expressing negative emotions really help to focus people on the problem at hand. And I think we've discussed this before and to come up with solutions together as a result. But it's also true that negative emotions can like positive emotions rally people together, especially in this case behind um, or against a common enemy or common concern. So I think trying to connect with people in a more authentic way, not running around all the time saying everything's terrible and I'm terrible. And, you know, but I think just being honest with people about you know, how it's been in general, for you, for your team, and for the organization. I think that's, that's valuable. Uh, another thing that we can do is we can promote connection and belonging within an organization. I know a lot of people, including Third Way, have been doing this, you know, maybe creating times within the work week to connect with people socially or professionally, or if, if you have a larger organization, you can't obviously meet with everyone to delegate some of those delegate some of those tasks, maybe even setting up mentors for people within the organizations, people that, uh, that your staff can go to if they have a problem, if they have a concern. And I think finally, I wanted to mention that going back to our session on well-being, where we discussed the well-being of the individual entrepreneur, the owner manager, but also the well-being of their staff members, their team, that I think it's really essential now more than ever before to protect our time, right? To protect our work time, but also our non-work time. And that's difficult especially when people are working at home and they have caring responsibilities or when people do have positions of responsibility and they feel like they always need to be available and they always need to be on. But if you're that kind of person, then you're also signaling to your team that that's the way to manage things. And that's what they should be doing as well. And what you really need to do is prioritize and model self-care also. So you really need to take breaks you really need to think about exercise and eating well and to signal to other people that they should be doing these things as well. 
because um, that will create a happier and healthier and more productive workforce and one that's less prone to burnout. So Ben, um, what do you think about Um, I've got two two observations. One's very much a personal observation. But um, you know, if if you, I think everything you just said is gold. And uh, but it's overwhelming for a leader, for any person to to be able to execute all of those things. And I think as a as a leader, there is certainly this sense of yes, you want to show pe- people uh, show everyone every, you're okay and everything's okay. But I think also, and I know I've, I've made this mistake in the past. You can have such a busy day or such a busy week where you're going from meeting to meeting to meeting. And when you arrive at the meeting, you are becoming the person they need you to be. So sometimes that's the encourager. Sometimes that's the visionary. Sometimes that's the, the strategical thinker. Sometimes that's the rebuker. Like you, you become the person the meeting needs and you get to the end of the day or the week and you're emotionally exhausted. And it's because you've not taken care of yourself. You've not given yourself enough time to sort of decompress. And I found like, that to my own detriment, that that then leads to often feeling unwell um, and feeling exhausted and then not performing well. I think um, more from um, reflect on say a business more objectively, like the key thing is, is recognizing all of the things you just said, how they are vital tools for a business. And then like finding the people within the organization who are the right leaders for them. Some people are exceptional listeners. Like you know, I'd imagine most business leaders like are not in a crisis because they've got a hundred things on their mind. Uh, some people are uh, really, really gifted at actually getting to the root of the problem with people and mentoring and coaching or pointing them in the right direction. Perhaps a business leader won't be so great at following things through after listening. And um, I feel one of the things we, we do well in the business is that we do push responsibility out to individuals to say, well, if you want to be, if you want to lead this, you can, what support do you need from us? And um, you know, we've got a great people team here who are constantly reaching out, uh, creating committees, not just for the sake of it, but for like really meaningful outcomes for the individuals. And that leads to really meaningful outcomes for the business. Thank you. No, I think there's some really great advice there. And I agree, I don't think, the, I don't think any individual should feel that they have to take all, on all of those things by themselves. I think it's, it's about a collective effort across the organization. And so just turning now to uh, a couple of questions um, that we have from our viewers. Uh, one person asks, how can I... I think you might be better at answering that one than me, Rachel. I mean, I'll, I'll give my, uh, my little take on it, but it'd be interesting to hear, hear your side. I think um, it's about time. Like if, if empathy requires um, you standing in that person's shoes, to use like a, a cliche. And to do that well, it, it requires time. It requires a bit of research. It requires consideration. Um, and so that will, that's what my advice would be. If, if you want to employ empathy, well, take the time to think about that person or that client and their needs and their business needs and what they want to get out of a meeting with you. And you'll probably start to find the answers really quickly. Yeah, I don't know how much I can add to that necessarily. I think um, probably going back to some of the things that were mentioned already, that it's also not just about being act, an active listener, as you sort of imply then with staff, but I think that also applies to other stakeholders. Um, and remembering some of our previous sessions, what happens to one's suppliers and distributors and customers, et cetera, during this crisis, the pandemic as well, will at some point probably have an effect on your business too. So I think getting a sense for the emotional cues that um, your customer group uh, are sending to how they're feeling about certain things, whether, you know, it relates to dining out or, you know, coming to your office to, uh, to have a meeting, you know, trying to accommodate, I think where possible is, um, uh, is important and, and using some of that information to, to shape your communications with them and ultimately your sort of strategies, at least for the for the interim. Definitely, I think um, I'll, I'll add a, a kind of an antidote to that um, it's not so much thinking about um, your clients, but um, this is a recruitment example. So I don't know, over 10 years, I must have sat in over a hundred interviews where I'm interviewing someone for the job. 
And um, I say, oh, what do you know about third way? And I would say in 80% of cases, the response I get is the first line of text on our website. I know you were founded in 2009. And it's like, that's, and like, you know, for, like if you want sort of to think about like your, your client, think about that for me, I would always just roll my eyes, but like, we've not really done anything. You've just read the first line of the website right. and turned up. Like actually, like if anyone who's ever responded with like sort of like who's gone 20 pages into the website or found an article, it's like, ah, okay. Even if their view's not right, they've shown me that they're thinking about me. They've shown me that mm. they're thinking about the business and why this might be the right place for them. So um, again, I think that just requires, that requires time and it requires commitment, like personal commitment to want to try and understand your, your client. Yeah, and I think also going back to some of the earlier points, validating their concerns and, and again, sort of trying to, you know, the proof is in the pudding. So it's not just about saying, yes, I understand, and then not delivering, not doing anything mm -hmm. about their concerns, but trying to, to adapt, trying to adjust as a yeah. result. I think, I think these things are really important. Whether we're, we're talking about um, other kinds of values within the organization or empathy as being part of such. Uh, another question is... Really good question. So, mm -hmm. um, I I have a conviction that uh, all businesses reflect their leader um, for good and for bad, mm -hmm. um, and that might be a broader thing in leadership team. Um, you like I look at Third Way, some of the the good things about it. Yeah, I, I can recognise sort of the the personality traits and the passions of of myself and my my business partners, and some of the bad things I recognise in our characters as well, and so. I believe there is a strong onus on the leader to ensure empathy runs throughout the organization. And it should, like it, it, it has to come from the top, but it certainly should trickle down and it should be felt um, throughout the organization. And I would go as far as to say, um, the staff within an organization should have the right to appeal to it, to, mm. to, to ask for it or, or demand it or, you know, um, request it to be uh, factored into any decision-making process. And I think maybe just to add as well, um, there, there are also some, some suggestions in research that demonstrating emotional intelligence and emotional flexibility is, is quite critical to, to an organization and to its you know, resilience, sort of anticipating how people might feel if you do this or do that. And uh, again, acting uh, in accordance with such. So, so being able to, you know, even one of the examples I give to my students um, is if you know, for instance, that your boss is, let's say, pre-crisis times is grumpy on a Monday, but you have a brilliant business idea. Do you approach them Monday morning with this idea or do you wait until Tuesday? And I think emotional intelligence is showing that, you know, you sort of understand your, your boss's circumstances and also empathizing with them as well, perhaps in what they have to do over that day, but also to be taken more seriously and to have your ideas heard in a more positive fashion, you might wait until the Tuesday. So I think, you know, empathy is a, is a form of emotion uh, or it's even great, emotional it's intelligence great, in a way. It's a great example of how it needs to work both ways because right. equally an employer, a leader should go, hey, there must be people in my organization who are coming up with great ideas all the time, Perhaps they don't feel they have a forum to share them with me. How do I create that forum? Um, so that just shows how that, that sort of empathy, like I think all good things in, in a business should have a natural tension. There, there should be sort of, you know, uh, both leaders and staff holding on to it and sort of pulling both ways and actually making you aware that you're sort of under tension as opposed to just sort of cruising in the background. That's great. Thanks very much. And I think that's all we have time for today. So um, thanks everyone for your questions and for tuning in. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Take care and goodbye. Goodbye everyone.